From Camp Crystal Lake, it's the IGN Digital. Please welcome two men who wish Jason would murder them so they wouldn't have to see Avatar 2. It's Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. <laughs> Well, that was a good one. I like that. Uh, hey, Bob, who sent that one in uh, by chance? Lord Mountain Bat. No. Lord Balmont S. Dragons. There you go. Not his real name. Hey, pre-recorded Bob, who sent Pre- that pre-rec- one in? <laughs> <laughs> Balmont S. Dragons has sent in uh, some, some good stuff in the past. So uh, I don't know what his real name is, but I like that one. I do, too. And you know what else you like? What, about, what else do I like? My ice cream. i, I got to admit it, I do. Now, here's it's the thing. Now, la- last week... You did I mean, not want to eat my ice cream. Well, no, but it had bacon in it last week. It was Nutella bacon ice cream. Yeah, so that, good. That I'm not going to eat. So here's what, here's what I did, Wade. Here's yeah, what happened. What did you have? What did I have? So I was going to make this buttermilk cheese, uh, cheddar cheese bread, right? Mm-hmm. Now, you would try. Hey, if I gave you a piece of buttermilk cheddar cheese, like a little square, would you eat it? Buttermilk cheddar, cheddar cheese. cheese bread. Yeah, sure. So here's the thing. I make this buttermilk cheddar cheese bread. I go to four different supermarkets, and I can't find a supermarket that sells buttermilk. I'm not kidding. I mean, this is Los Angeles. It's the second largest uh, yeah. city in, the, in right. the country. Sure. Can't find buttermilk. Finally, I get a, uh, a quart of buttermilk. Yeah. 2% buttermilk. Sure. I make this uh, sharp, uh, this cheddar cheese, uh, this uh, buttermilk cheddar cheese bread. It's okay. It's not great. I'll give you a piece if, if you like yeah, okay. it. So I just made something I don't really like that much. And now I have three cups of buttermilk left because I had to buy a quart. Because that, that's all they had. Okay. So I'm like, what can I do with three cups of butter? I don't, I don't drink buttermilk. Who drinks buttermilk? Uh, what is it? What, what are you, Amish? <laughs> no one drinks buttermilk. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it. So I go uh, online, and I look up some recipes for ice cream. Buttermilk ice cream. Yeah. Turns out there is plenty of buttermilk ice cream. You can make waffles out of buttermilk, too. That is really true. Really good waffles. And I'm not a huge... I mean, I, 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 you know what? Whenever I have waffles, I love it, but I'm not a huge... Like, it's not on my radar for Oh, they, they were like Nutella bacon waffles, and you'd be all over Nutella it. buttermilk... Well, I'm, you know, I'm going to Google that right now. There you go. Uh, so I decide to make... Um, decide to make buttermilk uh, glazed pecan... And it's good. ...ice cream. I, I, I and You didn't want to eat it because you didn't want to eat the last one. But I made you eat it. Food gods, recipe gods. We need to do a new podcast on our food experiments. Yeah, you know, cause because there's no food uh, podcasts or TV shows. Yeah, but not with us. You know, I invented a new little uh, bruschetta deal yesterday. Yeah, you know, tell us about that. No, no, it's 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 really not that big of a deal. No, it's very simple. Just cut up little uh, little discs of um, of French bread. You know, right off the off the end of the loaf. And you um, painted it with a little bit a mixture of olive oil and herbs of Provence. You broil it for exactly three and a half minutes. Take it out, put some uh, some goat cheese on it, spread some goat cheese on room temperature, and uh, a little bit of shredded bait. Well, the goat cheese, then you put it back in, uh, and you broil that for about another minute. Burn that a little bit, get it a little brown. Take it out, put some shredded uh, basil on it, and some little slices of red um, grapes. And it's killer. It's amazing. See, the difference there is It's the is best that hors d'oeuvre ever. And it's cheap, and it's easy, and it's fast. See, I want ice cream. You want things from Provence. Yes, exactly. There are chocolate waffles. So, Mark, what yes. do you call a donkey in the corridor? You call that an ass in the hall. A hall ass, and that's what we're going to have to do to get through this show today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hall wow. Ass. Thank I you. I didn't see that coming. I know, but you're almost, you're almost there. You had just the order reversed. Pays to be blind if I yes, didn't see that coming. All right. Oh, well, no, wait. We have the, uh, uh, here's the, we have the uh, winners of our giveaway. We do indeed have winners of the giveaway. And, uh, but before that, by the way, Bacon, you know, Kyle Stevens, longtime listener, uh, emailed us about uh, the history of bacon, and uh, it was very entertaining. Did you read that? Uh, I did, and you know what? Uh, it's fascinating. About Edward, about, uh, it is Edward, yeah, Edward Bernays, who basically was like the, considered the, the godfather of uh, propaganda. He was the guy that was given the, the job to uh, basically take this useless meat that was left over the slaughterhouses and convince people, mmm, you want to eat this, this is bacon. And he said, bacon and eggs. Fascinating story. We'll, we'll read it in the next, next listener mail. But uh, You know, um, great I, story. I thank him for that because I love bacon. Yeah. I actually have five strips of bacon, raw, you know, raw, raw bacon, in my refrigerator right now. I can't decide what I should do with it. This has nothing to do with it. <laughs> nothing to do with anything. Okay, here's what's going to happen. Where you're going to talk about... Winners of the contest. Oh, yeah, here's what's going to happen. Here's yes. the show. First thing that will happen is Wade yeah. will talk about the winners of the contest. That's right. Then... 
Wade will peel off and talk about the crap that nobody likes to talk about. No, we're going we're to start with No, the, no, no, because you have to do that. No, I don't. Because while you do that, I'm going to uh, oh, go get okay. you a slice of this uh, All right, very buttermilk good. cheddar cheese bread that I don't like. Okay. And I'll see if you like it. All right. Okay, so talk well, about First off, the, uh, winners of the contest yeah, of exactly. the Blu-ray of Uncle Boon Me, who can recall his past lives, the first ever Blu-ray from Strand Releasing, which won the Cannes Film Festival last year, directed by the famous Thai director known as Joe, because his real name is just endless and unpronounceable. Uh, the winners, two of them, by sheer freaking coincidence, came from Orlando, Florida. Uh, Alex Vasquez and Chavel Dixon, congratulations. And then uh, Bradley Ross of Warner, Oklahoma, is the last winner. And we know all about Orlando, but we saw, hmm, Warner, Oklahoma, named for the studio, named for the Warner Brothers. I don't know. But what do we know about Warner, Oklahoma, Mark? You know, I have this, uh, I love Google. And the reason I love Google is because it allows you to go to any town in the world. Yes. And on Street View, just drive up and down the streets. Yes. Now, when I heard Warner, Oklahoma, first of all, I thought, well, at least there's one cool person in Warner, Oklahoma. The rest probably don't like Jews. But at least there's one <laughs> cool person in Warner, Oklahoma. And we are rewarding this cool, cool person with a DVD. Bradley Ross. Yes. yes. So I looked at Warner, Oklahoma. And uh, as of the 2000 census, there's only 1,430 people in Warner, Oklahoma. Pretty 25% awesome. 25% of the population is Native American. Awesome. Isn't that bizarre? That's pretty great. Now, I, I don't, it, it, it's only 1.3 square miles. We reach everywhere. That's, that's pretty amazing. Including Egypt. Yes, we do. And also, we are d- accepting submissions for new openings. Please get those to us at gods at digigods.com. You can send us anything at gods at digigods.com. Please visit the Facebook page. We're going to make that a more integral part of the uh, the show going forward. Maybe even have some contests on the Facebook page. Yes, Wade, Wade. I know, I know. I've been slacking. You're slacking. I'm slacking. Oh, so go, go talk about crap no one okay. cares about. Because uh, I'm going to get you some buttermilk. Cheese bread. You do that. And uh, meanwhile... Uh, do, you want, do you want butter on the buttermilk cheese bread or just like a piece of buttermilk cheese bread? No, just a, a pure, pure bread. Okay. Just pure bread. Yeah, look how funny I am. I'm actually going to talk about a bunch of television stuff that uh, comes to us from Gaim. Gaim, of course, uh, usually does exercise videos, but they also have contracts with a lot of for a lot of television product, Learning Channel, Discovery Channel, uh, Animal Planet, that kind of stuff. And uh, a lot of new releases there that are worth mentioning. Uh, Man, Woman, Wild... This is from the Discovery Channel through Gaim, and uh, if you just really enjoy, if you love any of these kind of uh, travel shows, um, this is a way. This is kind of not how you want to travel. It's sort of the wild way of traveling, and uh, you know what? It's this husband and wife team, and uh, they take you to exotic places: the Amazon, Tasmania, uh, Tennessee, Utah, Louisiana. Somehow those don't belong in there. Botswana, Mexico. Uh, but anyway, it's it you know it's a it's got a kind of a novel feel to it. Uh, Weapon Masters also from Discovery Channel, more my speed. This is uh, really a fascinating history about all kinds of uh, exotic weapons, like the Roman scorpion. Like, what's a Roman scorpion? You ever heard of that? Uh, dueling pistols. That's one we all know about. You know the chariot bow. We all know about that. Greek fire is fascinating. Greek fire, dude. You know about Greek fire? Why would Greek fire be different from any other fire? No, no. Greek fire is like this kind of it's it, it was this thing that for like years like a, like a Greek farce or something. It's, no, it's like it's like a uh, napalm basically. It's like it's like an ancient napalm, and they would uh, they would you know before they they had cannons, they would sort of pump this out these giant siphons on boats. It's fascinating, or put it in like buckets and throw it over the walls of castles and things. Fascinating. Uh, and uh, the repeating crossbow, my favorite, the repeating crossbow, mm, otherwise known as the Gatling. Arrow. Uh, Pirates, Scourge of the Seven Seas, also from uh, the uh, Discovery Channel. This uh, was probably released a little bit more to be timely with the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean film. And uh, Dirty Jobs with Mike Rowe. This is one of the more popular uh, Discovery Channel shows. Uh, This is, you know, an obsession I don't really understand because people, I guess people want to feel better about what they do, and everyone hates their job. So you watch this, and you go, I'm glad I don't have that job. Uh, like a worm grunter, chicken buster, stand-in fugitive. That is pretty cool. Isn't that funny? I, I, I do like this show, just because it's so, it's so off the beaten path. Shark feeder. There's here's, one you want to apply for. It's actually, it's actually surprising you. And telling you things you didn't know. True. As opposed to watching and you go, Jersey Shore. Why, which why on earth would anyone want that job? And then you remember we have like 9, 9% unemployment, and you think, well, I'll bet they're grateful to have a job. That is true. Uh, American Chopper, senior versus junior. I, I don't know. If you, if you like the whole Jesse James 
thing with like you know pimp your ride and cool choppers and the whole thing fine watch you know i, I guess there's some appeal here i'm a you know the the, the, the bikes are cool but i kind of don't get the culture too much but hey you know rock on uh if you love pets here's we got america's cutest dog oh these dogs are so cute you know my in-laws just adopted two puppies did they now two little abandoned puppies they're so adorable what are their names well we named them ginger and coco Oh, and this is their coming out. This is their coming out in fame, Ginger and Coco. You know what? Uh, we should uh, throw them a DVD. Because they're, uh, they, 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 one is like ginger colored, the other one is cocoa colored. Two little sisters. Oh, that's they're so cute. Really? Uh, you or, could have named them after anything, uh, your favorite gin, movie. Ginger TV. Rogers and Coco Chanel. No. Ginger and Coco. It's food. It's color. It's a person. All three. Triple meaning. We're, we're, we're heavy. Uh, yeah, America's cutest dog. Oh, my gosh. These dogs are so cute. They're so incredibly cute. And um, in keeping with that, we have both Cats 101 and Dogs 101. All of this is uh, from Animal Planet. Which Stupid course, animals. You know, Animal Planet doesn't do enough about, like, cockroaches and stuff. By the way, pill bugs. Hmm. You're familiar with pill bugs. Sure. Little roly-polies. They roll around. You touch them. They're like armadillos. They, they roll up and, uh, you know, Fred Flintstone plays uh, ping pong with them. Right, that whole deal. Sure. They're crustaceans. You know that? They're the only crustaceans found on land. So they're fish. They're, well, they're crustaceans, which means that they, um, they eat their own feces and they uh, drink out of their anus. True. True story. You know what? Fact. It used to be. Take yeah, that you, to the bank. You got to go to 42nd Street to find and that's, to do that. And why I'm. <laughs> caution extra. Oh, my gosh. That caution extra fitty, too. Uh, Dogs 101 and Cats 101, uh, pretty great, actually. This is not just sort of cutie stuff. This is very informative. You learn about a lot of different breeds and, uh, you know, genetic history and what defines a breed and, you know, why they're one's this way and the other one's that way. Oh, um, cats, with dogs, stupid cats. See, with dogs, I, cats I, are dumb. I, well, I learned more about the dogs. Cats, kind of every breed is more or less the same. They just no, look different. No, they're not. Yeah, they kind of all cats behave the same. Cats are dumb. Some dogs are more affectionate than other dogs. Cats 101. No cat is affectionate. They're all stupid cats. I love cats. They're the dumb. But what's cool about cats is that they are uh, they basically hate everyone and everything. But they love me. No, they cats don't. Cats 101. All sorts of breeds here. Yeah. Like Atlanta, Himalayan, Japanese bobtail, crazy right? cats, puffy cats, and American short hair type cats. Right. Stupid cats. Yeah. They're so dumb. Uh, back to a few things from Discovery Channel, uh, but still on the animal front. Shark Week, Restless Fury. Uh, this is two discs with, uh, you know, a variety of, uh, Shark Week shows on it that just sort of, uh, emphasize how bloodthirsty and really scary these things are. Um, you know what? I don't see that any difference in any of the Shark Week stuff. It's sort of all the same, but I guess for people that really groove on sharks, there you go. Uh, how stuff works, food and beverage. We were talking about food earlier, and uh, how stuff works is uh, is really pretty interesting. This uh, focuses on corn, wheat, salt, beer, and coffee, and uh, it's got I like all the kind website. Of, I like the how stuff works website. You no, know, it's really interesting. That and the show is interesting too. But there's a it, it's more in, honestly. I almost got a little bit like annoyed at all the, the the details. I really don't need to know how my food works, how it's how harvested, and. You know, all that, like, I don't need to know that most corn is not edible, and I don't really care. I, I just want to eat it. But if you, if, if you dig on that, fine. It's, well, there's, it's really a, uh, there's a very interesting documentary called King Corn. Yes. And King Corn tells you all about the uses of corn. Corn is pretty much, in one way or another, used to make everything we eat. I know. Everything. Sh- sugar. Um, no, no. Steel. Uh, <laughs> Do you sa- eat steel? Satellites. Oh, everything we eat, eat, not just everything. Well, a bit in a sense, everything Computers. too. Computers, really, everything we eat. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. Yeah. Steak and. Uh, surviving the cut, go beyond the call of duty. Nutella, bacon, ice cream. Yeah, uh, this is a D- Discovery Channel uh, two discs on uh, basically everything you need to do to become a hardcore grunt, a jar-headed military man. Pretty intense, uh, I, you know. They've shown some of this stuff in movies, all the stuff that uh, military men go through, everything from G.I. Jane to Full Metal Jacket. I got to tell you, none of it does any of this stuff even the slightest bit of justice. Uh, this is – it's really pretty hardcore. When you meet somebody who's been a Marine, tip your hat to them because that ain't easy. That really ain't easy. And then lastly, a show, lastly, a show from the Travel Channel, Mysteries at the Museum. This is the full first season on three DVDs. Uh you ever seen any of the, the Mysteries at the Museum shows, Mark? No, I have not. No, uh, I have not. Well, 
it's really interesting. You'll never see a museum uh, quite the same way. This, uh, the 12 episodes here get into basically the backstories of stuff that you find in uh, museums, and you oftentimes forget that these things really are, that there's almost a, a novel to everything that winds up getting found and deemed appropriate for museum representation, for placement in a museum. You know, you sort of have to make the cut. Like getting into a museum for old stuff is almost like, you know, making the cut to become, like becoming a movie star or something. You really have to audition, and you gotta, it's, like, it's a big deal. So, uh, are you, are you going to feed me that bread now? Yeah, here's what we'll do. Yeah. Now, I, I like to preface this bread by saying I don't really like it. Um, it's, but you're going to force me to eat it. Well, you, you'll try, and you probably won't like it, and then you'll, well, I'll just toss it. But um, it's probably better if you eat it with something, like eggs and a slice of this bread. I'm eating it with you. Like, don't. <laughs> I'm not eggs. Oh, okay. Although I am scrambled. Um, <laughs> it's probably better if you eat this with something. Right. As opposed to just dry. Right, okay. But just here you go. Okay. This is dry. This is... Uh, this is dry, crumbly what bread? This is buttermilk cheddar cheese bread. Now, I think part of the issue might be that I, I didn't use full-fat buttermilk. I, I, I used 2%. And mm. um, I'm mm. thinking that... Um, <laughs> this, by the yeah. way, this is, by the way, live. This is live podcasting. This, this is, is live podcasting. This is what the Internet's all about. It's not bad. Definitely, you should have used full-fat. That's the only buttermilk I could find. Well, here, let me tell you something. All they had was 2%. I swear to God, went to four places. I've been doing some recipes lately that call for skim milk ricotta and skim milk par- uh, um, uh, 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 mozzarella. Forget it. Get with the, get the whole stuff. Never get anything skim. Nothing wrong with skim milk on your cereal, but if you're making a recipe with any kind of cheese, cheese that is made with skim milk is disgusting. Get rid of it. Yeah. Full I, fat. I, I sh- well, the buttermilk yeah. should have been full fat. Buttermilk should have been full fat. Now, that being said, you are eating it. It's, um, it's not bad. It's a little dry. And okay. the idea of buttermilk cheese bread mm-hmm. sounds exciting. Yeah. But actually eating it, it's okay. Not bad. All right. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. All right. New movies. Shall we hit new movies? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hit that's new right. This is a podcast. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That sure is. Uh, Johnny Depp did a film directed by Jim Jarmusch. And uh, this is not one of Jim Jarmusch's best. This is a gold dead man. Actually, I don't, you know, oh no, you know what? Actually, the one uh, wh- which is the one he did with um, Forrest Whitaker. Oh, um, Ghost Dog. Ghost Dog. What, I what? love Ghost Dog. Do you, do you really? Love, oh, I love Ghost Dog. What, what, what do you think of Dead Man? I think it's okay. I think Jarmusch okay. is kind of. Uh, well, here's the thing about Dead it. Man. It's, it's. I mean, the photography is beautiful, black and white. While I hear, while I try to wash this. Very dry bread down. Well, all right, fine. Gone. Hang on, I'll give you some water. Keep okay. talking about Dead Man. Okay. My goodness, that's it, dry. It is dry. It's it's, it's not not untasty, like if, but if it's, you if you if you just took a sunny side up egg and put it on top of this bread, it'd yeah. be good. Or if you took a big slab of butter, yeah. Also, I probably should have sliced it thinner. Okay. Yeah. Well, g- g- give me something to wash this down with. <laughs> My goodness. Uh, all right, uh, Johnny Depp stars in uh, Jim Jarmusch's Dead Man. Beautifully photographed in black and white. Features some interesting sporting performances. Um, Johnny Depp is okay. I actually think, you know, like Lance Henriksen is great in this. We talked about him last week. Uh, Michael Wincott, who played a lot of bad guys in the 80s and 90s. Crispin Glover, Iggy Pop, Billy Bob Thornton, uh, Jared Harris, Gabriel Byrne, uh, Robert Mitchum, John Hurt, Alfred Molina. All these people show up in this movie. Robert Mitchum is in it for like a blink. Uh, So it's kind of interesting that Johnny Depp is sort of the least interesting performance in the movie. Um, I mean, it's really an amazing bunch of people that, that roll through this film. Crispin Glover and Iggy Pop in the same movie. Seriously, there's a trivia question. When did Crispin Glover and Iggy Pop show up in the same movie? Uh, great photography by Robbie Muller, who, of course, is one of the great German DPs of the last 20 years. However, it's, you know, sometimes Jim Jarmusch is his own worst enemy. And uh, it, it, the whole kind of, you know, Johnny Depp as uh, William Blake in this uh, weird kind of uh, surreal western noir is almost a way to put it. Um, well, what, what he's doing is he's taking these western conventions and, and turning them on their heads, which he does with everything, but it just if sometimes it, it Jarmish is so Jarmishy, you he loses you. And, uh, you know, some, this, is, this is one of those films where he kind of lost me a little bit. It's not I, bad, but it's, it's a little bit unsuccessful. Well, it's very quirky because that's what he does. The Blu-ray... This is a low-budget film. This doesn't need to be on Blu-ray, but... Um, it's really good photography. I mean, it, it, it definitely it transitions. That's true. 
Uh, there's um, a deleted scenes and a music video. That's it. Uh, and by the way, this is uh, one of the Miramax titles that is being released by Echo Bridge now. Uh, so they obviously, uh, you know, didn't didn't go to town on the uh, the special the the special features. Venom is another one from the Miramax Echo Bridge line, and um, I also don't really know why this had to be on Blu-ray, except for the fact that everyone loves horror films. This was made in 2005, and it kind of came and went, and um, I don't, you know, I don't know. It, it's uh, it, it's it, it's a Southern Gothic swamp horror film, and uh, it's, you know, you could take Friday the Thirteenth and set it in a swamp. It's still, uh, you know, not that great. More great from the uh, the same line, though I'm still very I'm very iffy about recommending this, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Um, we got a, we got uh, Twin Dragons, Jackie Chan film. Yeah, but it's Ringo Lamb and Choi Hawk. This again from the Miramax Echo Bridge tandem. Um, but I got to tell you, it's I have a real problem with the way that all of the Jackie Chan films were done on Miramax for a whole variety of reasons. Mainly uh, Harvey Scissorhands. Mainly the fact that it's not in the original Cantonese and you don't have the access to it. It's like it's in, almost inexcusable to release a Jackie Chan film without the option to listen to it in Cantonese and watch it in subtitles, dubbed in English. Not as funny. Now this is a brilliant film. It's absolutely terrific. It was co-directed by Choi Hawk and Ringo Lam. The thing was kind of a benefit for the Directors Guild of Hong Kong, and it's why it's much more entertaining. If you are a, a hugely familiar with Hong Kong film industry individuals with personalities, because you recognize all the directors who parade through this thing, and there's a ton of them. And uh, if you don't kind of get those in jokes, you miss about 20, 25 percent of the movie. That being said, the hot tub scene in this movie, and this is one of those you know brothers separated at birth deals, you know different paths in life. One's a, a you know a street brawler, the other one's a concert violinist, and Jackie Chan plays them both. The hot tub scene with uh, with Maggie Chung is one of the funniest things you will ever see on film, but not dubbed. So even though I'm glad this is out on Blu-ray, i got to tell you, get the import. Get it in the original Cantonese. Not that great. Not that great on, uh, on Blu-ray. Can't recommend this one, really. Wade, you know what I can recommend? You can recommend The Lookout? I like The Lookout, Wade. Did you really? Yeah, I did. It's a good movie. Right. It's a funky little film. It's about, it plays, uh, best, yeah, yeah, let me try that again. Scott Frank, who's a very uh, talented uh, screenwriter. Ooh, writer. Dead Again. He wrote uh-huh. Dead Again. Scott Frank wrote Dead Again. He also I was just talking about that yesterday. I love Dead Again. He wrote Minority Report, too. Yeah. He uh, directs his first... I don't think he's directed since, which is bizarre, because uh, The Lookout is a good little uh, good little kind of quiet, potboiler-type thriller where yeah. uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt plays this uh, promising uh, athlete in school, and he... He uh, gets into an accident. It kind of ruins his life, and now he's just like a janitor at a bank, and he winds up getting caught up in a heist in the bank. And uh, it's got a good cast. Jeff Daniels is in it, Matthew Good, Bruce McGill, uh, Isla Fisher's also. Is it Isla or Isla? I don't even know what it is. Uh, Isla, I think. Is it Isla? I think it's Isla. I did not know that. Yeah. Uh, Isla Fisher's in it. You know, this is a good little movie. It's very much, you know what, uh, put it this way. Uh, Frank also wrote Out of Sight and Get Shorty. Yes. So when you think about, like, really cool, quirky. Great writer. You know, I don't know why. Stuff, I, I don't know why we don't hear more from him. Uh, I would uh, very much uh, recommend. It. You know, it's very intelligent. It's pretty. It's pretty haunting for what it is because you feel bad for this kid. It's definitely a writer's movie, which you don't see a lot, and it's not all that uh, enamored of being exciting for exciting sense. It's not a gimmicky film. Uh, it's good stuff. The uh, this is again. This is Wade says. This is an Echo Bridge uh, release of a Miramax film, which is weird because this is a good movie. And Miramax just said, "Screw it." Well, they're they're picking and choosing clearly. Uh, there's a couple of uh, special features that are ported over from the um, DVD release, but uh, you know, if if I definitely give this a rental because it's a good little movie. You know uh, what really tanked hard? I'll tell you, Mark was uh, Mars Needs Moms. This was oh a my catastrophe. god! This was a terrible catastrophe. This really film, was. this this nearly destroyed Robert Zemeckis's career, and he didn't even direct this one. Uh, this based, was basically originally a book by Berkeley Breathed, the creator of Bloom County, one of the greatest cartoonists ever. I mean, Berkeley Breathed is genius. And he wrote this book, Mars Eats Moms, and they turned it into this unbelievably horrible, misbegotten, creepy motion capture monstrosity over at Disney, which uh, wound up becoming arguably, I would say, the biggest bomb of the year. I mean, of 2011, this is the, this, the stinker. I can't imagine a bigger bomb all year. Oh, in, in terms of cost versus... No, because uh, we've gone reaction. through the summer season, and pretty much everything this summer, you, you know, there were some disappointments, but nothing just straight up just flopped. And this thing was a catastrophe. It lost them easily at least $100 million. 
That's a tough pill to swallow if you're Disney. Um, so they terminated Robert Zemeckis' contract and, and killed his little motion capture experiment over on Frankenstein Avenue. And, um, you know, I, the people I feel sorry for here, obviously, are Berkeley Breathed and Simon Wells, who directed it, because Simon Wells is not a bad director. You know, he's a literal descendant of H.G. Wells. He was one of the directors of The Lion King, and he then uh, went and did his live-action debut with H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, you know, which was a neat little twist. Oh, look, it's H.G. Wells' great-great-great-grandson or whatever directing an adaptation of his novel. And it wasn't a bad film. You know, uh, Jeremy Irons was a little creepy. But this thing is just misbegotten straight through and through. And, you know, the, the, the real problem here, motion capture. This probably could have been a perfectly acceptable and charming animated film, but motion capture is just freaky. We got this in both the uh, Blu-ray and DVD uh, double pack and the 3D Blu-ray plus Blu-ray plus DVD plus digital copy four pack. And uh, they try to make this a little appealing by throwing on uh, alternate and deleted scenes that are exclusive to the 3D disc, but it doesn't matter. It still stinks. Uh, and the extras here kind of tell you that there really isn't all that much to do to salvage this film. They've got some, you know, featurette stuff, extended opening, um, and a thing here called Martian 101, which is speaking Martian with lessons from an expert, whatever. Uh, not recommended. Not super recommended for me, at least, is uh, Super. Yeah, I kind of made that work. Super is a uh, one of those uh, transgressive superhero satire type films. You from keep a, getting those. I know. Well, you know what? I think uh, I think that the, the tipping point has been reached. The Woody Harrelson thing and the Michael Rapaport. I like thing. the Woody Harrelson movie. Defender. I like Defender. Defender. I did too. The problem with this movie, Super, which and Michael Rainbow, Rapaport, which was special, which was special, which yeah. is good too. Uh, this is definitely the worst of the bunch because the problem here is that you have a guy, you have this guy James Gunn who's directed who directed it, and uh, Gunn is a he also wrote it, but Gunn is a trauma guy. Yeah, and you know Uh-oh. you 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 can take the writer director out of trauma, but you can't take the trauma <laughs> out of the writer director. Oh, that's true. And what you have is you have a movie with some good ideas, but they just don't coalesce into a cohesive whole because you get this guy uh, Rain Wilson who plays this, you know, this uh, kind of this doughy, yeah. gawky, short order cook, and he has this religious epiphany. And he decides to become a superhero where he's going to run around with a wrench and just beat the crap out of people. And so you get the religious overtones, which I liked, and you get uh, sort of these psychosexual overtones, which are sort of inherent hiding in plain sight in superhero culture, which I liked. Uh, But with that, you also get laughs that seem a little out of place and a tug for the heartstrings at the end which is totally out of place so i feel like he's trying to do a whole bunch of different things here and it never really comes together totally but you know i I would imagine uh from a cult standpoint you know if you're the type of person who likes superhero films and like defendor and and likes edgy comedy whatever edgy even means anymore then you can pick it up give it a rental but uh I, i think you'll ultimately not be all that satisfied the um the climax of the film the the big shootout is actually pretty intense Hmm. But uh, otherwise, it's okay. Rain Wilson. I go back and forth on him. You know what? I, I, the, thing, the thing with Rain Wilson is that I just feel like I don't take him seriously. No, I don't either, you even know? when he's being serious. Yeah. yeah. Mark, we both had uh, – we saw the same screening of Your Highness. We sat there with uh, our, our friends Tim Cogshill and Andy Klein, and I think we all had pretty much the same reaction, which was, uh, uh, Your Highness is just a catastrophe of epic proportions. This is the most unbelievably unfunny film of the last several years. I don't know what they thought. Danny McBride, we talked about this last week. Not funny. Don't get it. He, I just don't get it. You know what? I, and he is all over this thing. He's the executive producer. He's the writer. He's the guy who wrote and his buddy, Ben Best. They wrote this up. It's going to be so funny. It's like a stoner comedy, except it's set in like medieval times with, uh, you know, uh, people saying D and thou and as chivalrous knights. Oh, my gosh. It's horrible. It's dreadful. And how far David Gordon Green has come, the guy who once did George Washington and all the real girls, and now doing stuff like Pineapple Express, Pineapple Express and Your yeah. Highness, just stoner comedies, because he gets paid more. He sold out. This was the guy who once idolized uh, Terrence Malick. So sad. I interviewed him once, and he seemed like a perfectly nice kid, and now he's just making junk. It's so sad. Sell out. Anyway, uh, Your Highness, not a good film by any means. Natalie Portman, totally wasted. Zoe Deschanel, completely wasted. James Franco, uh, he's wasted. I don't get it. Well, I don't either. Anyway. Yeah, you know what? This is one of those stoner comedies where the movie just feels like it's stoned. Yeah. It's just slow 
and it goes on forever. It thinks it's funnier than it is. The timing is all totally off. Yeah, I, I just don't get it. This is a terrible film. And you know what? It's on Blu-ray as well, and it's got a bunch of features, uh, special features on it, like a gag reel. Like the, even the gag reel, you're like, oh, we're so funny. Look at us with our pot jokes. Aren't we hilarious? Woo, we're so ca-. It's like, you know but what? You Shut know what, up. You know what this movie should have been? Uh, Star Wars. It should have been Fast Times at Ridgemont High. See? What? Now, there, now right there. Now, that's the way you do this kind of a movie for this audience. That is a clever, clever film. Fast Times at Ridgemont High, folks, is finally on Blu-ray. That's right. It's on Blu-ray. Thanks to Universal. Not a great Blu-ray. Not any new extras per se. They throw some BD Live and Pocket Blue access on here, and you control. And uh, you know what? I it's all really kind of uh, forcing the point. Uh, the extras have been released previously. Feature commentary with Amy Heckerling, the director, and the writer Cameron Crow. Yay! Last good thing Cameron Crow did. And uh, oh, Cameron Crow's just announced something new. Something horrible. Well, he has that uh, that oh. rock and roll documentary. What, what, uh, oh no, there was something else that I, I just read that he was going to do, and I, I just cringed. Oh, the uh, not the uh, I bought a zoo, right? That's I like, can't that's remember. been done. We uh, we 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 bought a zoo. No, I don't know. I don't the, know. Is the, the Pearl Jam I, documentary? No, no, no. It was a, it's a, uh, something else. Anyway, Vanilla Sky Two. This oh, it better not be. Uh, this is the film that basically made Sean Penn, uh, and it you know Judge Reinhold, Phoebe Cates, uh, a lot of ju- you know Eric Stoltz shows up in this. It's really actually uh, amazing how many people. Uh, it, uh, Forrest Whitaker shows up in this. It's incredible yes. how many people show up in this movie who went on to really really big careers. Uh, Anthony Edwards, you know, it's it's a it's really kind of a cool who's who when you watch it, uh, and and still a nice raunchy comedy from an era when people were unafraid to make raunchy, youth-oriented comedies. If this were done today, it would be rated PG, PG-13. You know although, that. Although, did, do, did you see the trailer for the uh, Jonah Hill film, The Sitter? Yeah. That thing looks, looks pretty... Per- yeah, it looks, it looks edgy. I mean, if... Yeah. I, I, I guess a swearing in front of children is what is uh, I, I hope edgy they, nowadays. I hope they just don't pull their punches with that one. I really do. Anyway, great music. Uh, not a great transfer, per se. They kind of phoned this one in. But you know what? If, you ha- if you're replacing everything with Blu-rays, you could do worse. You know, Wade, I was not a fan of the movie that you're holding in your hand. Paul? I didn't get you it. You didn't get no, it, really? it wasn't funny. It just, oh, it was, my gosh. I it, love this movie. It was another sort of... Yes, I get it. Look, it looks like the shot of Close Encounters where he does the thing. Look, oh, it looks like the kids. I so love this movie. Because you're not... You, you, all you're doing is looking for the references. You're not being... You, but, you're but not you laughing. Know, here's what I enjoyed about this. And as long as we're speaking about Jonah Hill, this, of course, was uh, directed by Greg Matola, who directed Superbad, which Jonah Hill co-wrote. Uh, Greg Matola did The Day Trippers. And, you know, he's one of those kind of indie darling guys. And he's, um, I think he goes a little bit back to his, his roots here. It, what's cool about Greg Matola is that he's, he's bald, right? He's, he's, he looks real cool. He's got, like, he's bald and he wears glasses. Um, he's, he's got one foot in the indie world, but he's still a little bit irreverent and funny in a real commercial sense that feels much more studio. He really walks an interesting line, and I thought this was terrific. It was uh, This, of course, was uh, co-written by Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, the uh, Shaun of the Dead Hot Fuzz guys, who play a couple of uh, fanboy nerds on their way to a uh, convention in the U.S. They're from England, and uh, they wind up along the way uh, picking up an escaped alien from, uh, uh, you know, Nevada, uh, New Mexico, no, New Mexico, to Area 51. Yeah, that's it. I always forget Area, what is it? Area 51. Anyway, uh, and uh, Seth Rogen voices the alien, who's named Paul, and uh, comedy ensues because it references every single imaginable science fiction film from the 80s, which is when I was enjoying all those movies. Well, so and was I, but just make me laugh. Yeah, but it made me laugh. I thought it was funny. I liked it. You know what? You know what I really loved Kristen Wiig? Hysterical in this. Loved her. No, she's Every great. second of it. I she- like this better than I like. I like this more than fanboys, and I actually like it more, I think, than Free Enterprise. And Free Enterprise is pretty damn funny. Yes. Yeah. But I didn't like fanboys necessarily. You didn't? I, you know, but again, Paul is one of those films where they think if they run around and say dude, that means comedy. All right. Well, we're talking about dudes and stoners, Mark, as long as we're on the subject. Ooh, dazed and confused. Yeah. Now, this was a um, – was this not a uh, Criterion release too? Uh, no. Why? I thought this was on – didn't Criterion release this at some point? Dazed, dazed and, and confused? Yes. In fact, Wade – just for you, I'm going to look this up because I really like this film. Because you know, this film introduced us to uh, Matthew yeah, McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, actually, this, this this was on Criterion. You're right. Back in 2006, there was a Criterion release of this. Um, Good call, Mark. You probably have that. I'm sure I do. That means I can have this. 
Wow, that's interesting. Days and Confused, all the way back in 2006, Criterion, and they snatched that back. You know, Universal did. So Universal originally released it in 2004. There was a Criterion release in 2006, and then there was a Universal High Def release, HD DVD, in 2006 as well. So they must have snatched that right back. That's interesting. Now, um, the film has one of those casts sort of like uh, Everybody's Fast in Times. This. Yeah. No one had heard of Ben Affleck, really. Nope. No one had heard of Matthew McConaughey. Nope. Parker Posey, you know, kind of not really. Not really. No, this was kind of her first thing, too. And Matthew McConaughey stole this movie just with that one scene where he's talking about working for the city, talking about what's under the hood of his car. Great. He stole that scene, stole that movie. And then what happened to him? Yeah. You know, I feel bad for McConaughey because he's the only guy who who could star in, you know, a Steven Spielberg film, Amistad, and have it be considered... A misstep. True. It's weird because his, yeah. la- his last two, his the the couple of films that he had done right after Days and Confuse uh, were really prestigious films. Well, they kind of they kind of uh, anyway. We're moving on. We well, got, well he, uh, just to just to get the remember, oh, Donkey in the Corridor. We got a uh, haul ass. <laughs> yes, you were saying. I'm not saying. I'm not saying anything. Okay, I'm done. Oh, con- it was Contact and um, Amistad. Yes. So here it's like. He, the, the only guy who somehow made like a, a, a Zemeckis film and a Spielberg film yeah. into career missteps. I mean, that takes a lot. Yeah, and of course, true. now he's like one of the most punch jokey guys out there. Uh, we got a little film here that is kind of a, an annoyance uh, of mine. This is the uh, called Jumping the Broom. You know, we had this movie with... Uh, We've had this movie at least a dozen times. This is uh, one of those horrible movies that they make because they think that if you're black and you live in the inner city that you must like stupid comedies that are just about your experience and we don't actually have to make them good. And uh, these things were getting released pretty routinely for a while. Now they're all going straight to video and straight to uh, DVD, straight to Blu-ray. This is a Blu-ray of this thing, Jumping the Broom. Uh, Two different families uh, from different sides of the track, but they're both black. The Watsons are uptown. The Taylors are downtown. Fill in the blanks. Comedy ensues. Oh, will they get through the wedding? I don't know. These people just can't get along. Uh, you know what? It's a real waste of a lot of great talent. Um, it really is. I mean, I just wish some of these actors would do really good work again and somebody would give them good work. Angela Bassett, for crying out loud, was an Oscar nominee at one point. Loretta Devine is a perfectly great actress. I mean, Waiting to Exhale is a terrific film. Mike Epps, come on. Give these people some, some work. You know, give them some real jobs. Don't stick them in these dumb comedies. I, they they got to they gotta pay the mortgage, I know, but make some real movies for them. You know, use these talented people. Um, you know, that being said, I, it's, it, you know, I've seen worse, but I expect more. I just expect more. Hi, Wade. Hi, Mark. Oh, you want me to talk about yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give us, a, give us our Barry Levinson fix. Uh, Sleepers from 1996. This is a uh, crime film. It has a great cast. Kevin Bacon, uh, Robert De Niro, Dustin Hoffman, Jason Patrick, Brad Pitt. And this is a film about these uh, these kids who were uh, they kind of when they were younger they kind of played this kind of prank and they got sent to a detention center. Uh, had, that, that's a putting it mildly. Exactly. They, yeah. And when they get out, they Yeesh. they decide to get revenge horrible, on everybody. Horrible, 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 tormenting detention center. Exactly. And when they get out, they want to get revenge. And you know what? I like this film for the same reason that I like Bugsy. I, I there, sometimes Levinson really kind of gives you he really puts you in that place. There's something mainstream about him, but yet somehow it's still pretty evocative. It is one of his of, last of decent films. Yes. Yeah. And it's good stuff. And, you know, De Niro's done a, a 500 of these movies at this point where he shows up as a priest and has, like, five scenes and yeah. that's it. Um, but it's got a great cast, and it's, it's, it's good stuff. I, I liked it. The transfer is okay. It's, you know, well shot. Uh, it's on Blu-ray. John Williams does the music, which, of course, is always great. And, um, you know, you will, love it. you will love it for the acting. You know, there's an interesting deal with uh, Image that Sony has, and it's similar to kind of what Miramax is doing with Echo Bridge and what a lot of other companies have done where they sub-license stuff, they say. And in fact, the Paramount stuff that's being released by Olive, where they say, you know what, well, we got a ton of stuff in our vault, and we're never going to release it. And uh, here, we'll, we'll let you try to market it, and if you can get somebody to buy it, you get to keep, you know, a buck fifty, and, uh, you know, in a year or two, if we don't like how you're doing, we'll terminate the contract. There you go. And so Image is releasing a lot of stuff from Sony these days to Blu-ray, uh, stuff that Sony simply would never pull out of the out of the uh, the vault and release itself. One of those is the 1993 Van Damme film Nowhere to Run, 
which I love the quote on the cover of the box. What does it say, Mark? The best Van Damme movie ever. Who? David Sheehan, KNBC, uh, NBC TV. Yeah, David he Sheehan. He stopped had, reviewing movies. He stopped reviewing movies like a decade ago. And we're still, we're still quoting him. It's like, okay. Uh, he used to be a member of LAFCA, you know. David Sheehan. Is he still reviewing movies for anybody? I don't know. But I know that I saw David Sheehan at one LAFCA meeting. One. Well, the, the, it was the first voting meeting that I was ever at when we voted Best Picture of the Year to In the Bedroom, which I don't even remember what year that was. And she and she, she and I'd been at maybe four or five other meetings. I was admitted like that year or the year before. Never saw him. That meeting, he showed up and voted, and I never saw him again. Very well, strange. The thing, the things with guys like that is that since they can't write, yeah, if they're not on TV, yeah, what good are you? I know what, they 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 can't. They can't review anywhere. Well, anyway, uh, this is just one of those. It's, it's a horribly generic Van Damme film, but it's acceptable. I, I got to tell you, Rosette. Right. You mean a horribly generic, as opposed to, you know, as opposed to. Uh, uh, the, yeah, that. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, we're, we'll 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 tie them together. Go ahead. We'll tie them together. All three of these. Oh, you wanted okay. Yeah, let's do well, it. All, so, they all start different. You know, they, okay. Rosanna Arquette is uh, is is okay, but you know, it's just a standard Van Damme man against the masses. Uh, the uh, high kicker, and there you go. That's it. Um, Kurt Russell stars in Soldier. This was a weird little Kurt Russell film. This was uh, directed by Paul sure Anderson, not uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. No, the Paul Anderson who be- does big, dumb science fiction films. Uh, Horrible science fiction films. The Paul films. Anderson who sucks. Oh, he's terrible. He, thank goodness he didn't do The Six Billion Dollar Man. He was supposed to direct that for a while. Was he I really? just thought, oh, no. Well, you know who was supposed to star in that for the longest time was Jim Carrey. I know. Could they you were, imagine they, they were gonna do Paul a Anderson directing Jim Carrey in The Six Billion Dollar Man? Somebody would have lost a mil- $100 million on that. The worst. Anyway, uh, this takes place in the future. Uh, Galactic Wars, Slam Bam, blah, blah, crazy stuff. And it's written by David Webb Peoples. He was a decent screenwriter, but does a lot of stuff for hire. Well, yeah, but, uh, you know, he's a totally uh, tool, uh, cool guy. You know why? Yeah. He wrote Unforgiven, Way He wrote Unforgiven and 12 mm-hmm. Monkeys and Blade mm-hmm. Runner. Yeah. For some reason, he also wrote Soldier. This must have been a work for hire. Yeah, of course it was a work for hire. Uh, also on Blu-ray, Steve Austin, Tactical Force with Michael oh, J. Yes. White. Jai White. You know, uh, at this point, all these wrestler guys, and Steve Austin is, is kind of the premier one that everybody likes to stick into. He and, um, and, and John Cena, they're the ones that just show up in all these direct-to-video things because... They can, they can just go bald and muscular and pick up a gun and blow a lot of stuff up. And I guess that's the way that action heroes are today. They're, they're a phenomenon of uh, the direct-to-DVD, direct-to-Blu-ray wasteland. Hey, look, here's the thing. When you go to your Redbox kiosk in front of your 7-Eleven and you see uh, some, a big, nasty-looking uh, wrestler, because you, you, you just got through watching wrestling on Saturday night, yeah. you'll be like, oh, my God, it's more of Steve Austin. And there's no pl- point even explaining the plot. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that I find funny. Uh, special features on this. Inside, uh, featurette, Inside Tactical Force. The other two special features, trailer and fight sequence. But, all <laughs> I, but I just have to watch the movie and I'll see the fight sequence. Precisely. Stupid movie. Uh, speaking of stupid movies, Red Planet. Oh my gosh! Do you, Do you remember that this was the summer there were like there I were there were two there were two there was were, Red Planet and Mission to Mars. That's right. And Mission to Mars was the De Palma the the De Palma film, which actually had a few interesting things in it. Technically, well, it was, was not one, a good movie. No, there was one death I thought was very well done, which I yeah. won't say because someone might rent it. But it's not in Red Planet. This yeah. is Anthony Hoffman. Well, this is uh, this is a, a colonization of Mars phenomenon. You know, the Earth is dying. Blah 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 blah. And by the way, this is the only film this guy ever directed. Anthony Hoffman. This is the only yeah. film he ever directed. I know. This is it. This pretty much killed his career. This is why you know people people think I'm going to do a little advice here. People think, oh my gosh, if you have a chance to direct a big Hollywood movie, oh my gosh, do it. Well, yeah, I mean, it's awfully hard to turn down if, if you're broke and you can't make the mortgage payments, and somebody's offering you. You know, finally, based on your short film, like uh, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars to direct a big studio movie with uh, Carrie Ann Moss and Tom Sizemore and Val Kilmer in it, where you get to control a special effects juggernaut and mission to Mars. Oh my gosh, Red Planet! Yes, I'll do that. But you know what? It could kill your career too. It could make it impossible to ever get another film if the whole thing tanks, and uh, that's a tough call. That is true, and this thing tanked. It tanked. Oh, it tanked hard, and it's not very good. Uh, but the Blu-ray is. Actually, pretty good. I gotta say, Warner Brothers uh, could have just phoned this in. They put nothing on here by way of extras, some you know additional scenes, which is really negligible. But 
Um, they didn't really phone it in. They they really were very attentive to this. So uh, for that, even though it's not a good movie, I do give them credit for doing a really really good transfer on Blu-ray. So people who love the movie and don't care what we're saying, you'll 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 be perfectly satisfied with the Blu-ray. And uh, Copycat is a, a real waste of great female talent. Sigourney Weaver and Holly Hunter star in this, and uh, with supporting performances by Dermot Mulroney and Harry Connick Jr. of all people. Uh, I, you know what? John Emil is one of those guys who I just don't ever know what to think of him. He's a talented director. He, he's very, very good when he's good, but half of his movies are just horrible, and uh, it's always based on the material. And I, I just have to believe the guy doesn't really know how to pick good material, or else he just takes these jobs for, for a paycheck. But um, when he's on, he's on, and when he's off, he's horribly, horribly off. Um, this is uh, one of those really kind of uh, dumb thrillers from the uh, the mid '90s, uh, and uh, you know they all all those mid '90s thrillers all kind of they all feel like they were written in the shadow of Joe Esterhaus, don't they? Oh yeah, the, the, you know what? In the '90s, Esterhaus was the guy, and there's something about and, and the, everything that Esterhaus seems, thing, that thrillery it, thing, it's, pop boiler. It, 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 it feels like they're all trying to emulate what he was doing at the time, and uh, for that reason, it just I don't know. It's um, it just doesn't doesn't feel right. Holly Hunter really wasted. Sigourney Weaver really wasted. And uh, Will Patton's kind of the only guy that doesn't feel. He, he's always good. Will Patton. Oh, I like him. Even in the Postman. Sure. Yeah. I like the Postman. I do too. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know what I don't what I don't like, Wade. In the name of the rose. Now, in the name of the rose. Oh, is see from, now, uh, I don't mind this. It's it, not it's not good, but I don't mind it. Uh, this was actually Jean Jean Jacques. Uh, uh, no, uh, this is yeah. this is the film he did after Quest for Fire. Yeah, he did this five years after Quest for Fire. I know, which and I love Quest for Fire. I know it is great. Um, I remember, uh, I saw Quest for Fire, loved it. I was whatever, uh, yeah. three years old or something, yep. whatever I was, and I don't know why I realized that this existed, but I thought that if I could write the uh, write Fox Twenty Century yes. Fox and say to them. Hi, my name is Little Mark Kaiser, and I like your Widow movie. Can you please send me some information on your Widow movie? No, it was, it was just like, I like your Little movie. Can you please send me something on your, your Little Tiny movie? I don't know. I was a kid. I, I didn't know what was going to happen. And you know what they did? They sent me the press kit. 20th Century Fox sent me little, whatever, 12-year-old Mark who called, who, you know, this is before the Internet and, and feeling the need that they have to service every crazy message board contributor because there were no message boards in 1981 or whatever. And uh, they sent me the press kit. And I thought that was super cool. How nice of them. Anyway, Sean Connery plays a, a monk who is uh, investigating a murder in a monastery. And uh, it was based on the Umberto Eco book. So there's a lot of, like, you know, religious inspiration to it. But I just think from a plot standpoint or a screenplay standpoint, I just didn't I'll say this. Great. If you want to look for, like, a murder-solving monk, I prefer the Cadfield films, uh, the Cadfield Mysteries for British television with uh, Derek Jacobi. Uh, I like that better. But we've argued about that before. Uh, so never mind. the worst. Um, Music by James Horner Early James Horner score Yeah We got a couple of uh, Multi-film uh, Combinations here From uh, Mill Creek Mill Creek of course Is one of those uh, Public domain houses That uh, basically Calls together A lot of movies That everyone's forgotten Most of them Public domain And they throw them Onto these huge Compilations You can get For bargain prices and uh, Cowboys and Bandits comes out at appropriately the simultaneous time with Cowboys and Aliens. Yeah, well, it turns out bad timing. Yeah. They, they, uh, they should have called it uh, Rise of the Planet of the Cowboys and Bandits. Yeah, they, they probably should have. But, you know, it's, uh, you know they'll, they'll probably sell this for a while because it doesn't look like it was specifically designed to uh, capitalize on the movie, even though it quite clearly was. This includes 50 movies. That is 50, five, zero, 50 movies. 50 Blu-rays, all with Not Blu-rays. audio commentaries, oh, no, no, no. deleted scenes. No, no, no. 50, no, 50 DVDs with oh. nothing else. Oh, interesting. Yeah, 12, 12 discs, 50 movies. Uh, and I'll tell you, these are movies you've never heard of. I mean, they're from you know the 70s all the way, th- or from the, the 30s all the way into the, you know, the 50s and the 60s. It's all over the place. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these are just, they're just programmers. But you know what? They're, they're okay, some of them. Uh, Cavalier of the West with Harry Carey, not bad. Um, uh, you know, some of these, a lot of these I have seen, and obviously I'm going to tell you, we didn't watch 50 movies to review this. But there's some stuff in here that I have seen before, and the transfers are not terrible. A lot of times these PD houses, the, the, the transfers are just dreadful. 
uh, taken from like one inch masters. This stuff, not bad, not bad. And if you have a Blu ray player or a, an up converting player, it'll make it look even better. Uh, Tex Ritter, father of uh, John Ritter, is uh, stars in the 1939 film Westbound Stage. Tex Ritter, of course, a famous uh, recording star. He's also in Riding the Cherokee Trail. A bunch of these feature Roy Rogers, uh, you know, Silver Spurs, Romance on the Range, Roll on Texas Moon. Um, yeah, so this is this this is kind of uh, you know a, a nice little collection to have if you got somebody that just can't get enough westerns and you got a babysit grandpa with some old movies from the thirties. Do it. Dangerous Babes is twelve uh, exploitation films uh, featuring uh, hot and busty women. I have never heard of almost any of these, and I consider myself an expert in this genre. Sextet, I've heard of, because it has Mae West and uh, Tony Curtis and Dom DeLuise, and Sextet I definitely am familiar with. A lot of this other stuff, like Noon Sunday from 1975 with Mark Leonard, the original, um, you know, Sarek, father of Spock, and as, as well as the Ooh, Romulan commander. Yes, and Balance of Terror. Yeah, and Balance Good grief. Yeah, he shows up in this thing, along with Key Luke from uh, Kung Fu. Never heard of that. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting uh, little weird uh, exploitation discoveries here, if you dig that kind of thing. Mark, tell people who Dennis Woodruff is, please. Oh, my God. If you live in Los Angeles and you don't know who Dennis Woodruff is, you've never been outside. You, you, you know, I, I have to tell you this. There was one – I don't know if I told you this. There was one day about – Two, three years ago, when I was driving around, and within, I may have called you on this, within 60 minutes, I saw Dennis Woodruff pass by me in that obnoxious, overly painted, uh, self-promotional monstrosity of his, and then I saw Angeline in her little pink Corvette, and then I drove past Melrose Larry holding a sign at the intersection of Melrose and La Brea and doing whatever it was he was doing, touting some public you know, broadcasting thing that he was on. And I thought to myself, I have just seen the holy trinity of Hollywood weirdos. That's true. The, the famous yeah. for no reason. No reason. Uh, Hollywood. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, trifecta. Dennis Woodruff. Well, Wade, here's the situation. Uh, the Dennis Woodruff is an out-of-work actor who is famous for being out of work. In fact, he never works. In fact, he drives around Hollywood with a car painted uh, with his name on it that says something along the lines of, like, hire me, I'm Dennis Woodruff. And that's his shtick and the thing that the guy never gets hired. In fact, he's, he gets hired so little that if you go to his IMDb page, you realize his IMDb page has, like, five credits. I know. Five actual credits. Yeah, I know. As if, like, he really was not he really was in these movies. I know. Um, so he's a, big, uh, he's, a, he's a big zero. But Dennis Woodruff is nothing if not a rabid obsessive self-promoter and he uh with the good people of trauma somehow somehow that makes sense um they have released the dennis dennis woodruff collection volume one these are three films well we can we marginally call them films yes they are three um visual experiences let us call them visual experiences yes this doesn't really warrant much mention other than the fact that uh, Dennis Woodruff is a very bizarre phenomenon. And if you are anthropologically inclined, uh, then you'll probably want to watch this. What's really funny is that this is, uh, this is the, the Dennis Woodruff Collection Volume 1. I guarantee you there will never be a Volume 2. No, no. I guarantee right now he is, he is crapping out three films <laughs> in the next four days. That will become uh, uh, Volume 2. Volume 2, yeah. Yes. Um, while we still have a few minutes left, I want to knock through some martial arts stuff that is, uh, if you're a fan of uh, martial arts films as I am, you'll definitely want to check out some of these, though not all of them. Um, Clash is an okay film starring Johnny Try Win and Veronica uh, Enjo, and uh, it's so, oh, uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of a really threadbare plot. Um, you know this uh, this this mercenary killer stuff that re- just shows up in every single Asian film, in Vietnamese films, Hong Kong films, Thai films, um, and this is an attempt to kind of push the Vietnamese film industry to where uh, the Thai industry is. And you can tell they don't have the budget, they don't quite have the screenwriting talent, they don't sort of have all the pieces, but they've got you know a little bit of. Uh, you know, they, they sort of know the direction they want to go. So it's not great. It's okay. It wants to be a Thai film. It's not. Uh, slightly better is Empire of Assassins, starring Shi Miao and uh, Li Yuan. Um, you know, Chinese films always uh, have, have a little better something going. And in this case, it's, uh, it's a much bigger budget. 
It's a revenge story that uh, we've seen a thousand times before, but particularly well done. And I'm kind of surprised that Lionsgate did not release this on uh, Blu-ray, actually. I'm really surprised. Uh, it's really violent, but uh, pretty well acted. And uh, even though it's kind of boilerplate for the genre, it's, uh, it's decent. Uh, similar in vain is Bodyguards and Assassins. There's that word assassins again. This is directed by Teddy Chen. And this features the terrific Donnie Yen, who it, it, now that he's... Ba- you know, Donnie Yen is the same age as Jackie Chan and Jet Li. He's in his 40s. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've interviewed uh, and, and talked to Donnie on many occasions. The guy is not young. And yet he's having a career resurgence at the time that their careers are just dwindling. It's amazing. I mean, Donnie Yen has never been hotter. It's incredible. Uh, the guy is, of course, a wushu master, much like Jet Li. And he has, uh, he's really hitting his stride here. He stars in this with uh, mixed martial arts champion Kung Li. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, again, kind of a boilerplate plot, but really well directed. Uh, Teddy Chan is a very, very sharp director. And um, uh, this one I'd recommend just because Donnie is such a cool dude. Donnie is better, however, in this great, terrific, freaking unbelievable Blu-ray release from uh, WellGo of Legend of the Fist, The Return of Chen Zhen. If you don't know who Chen Zhen is, Chen Zhen is a fictitious character that was played by Bruce Lee in the original... Um, what are you doing? I'm reading uh, the spines of the DVDs we have left to talk about. Or yeah, we're not going to get to that. Oh, that no, that's, oh, that's, that's television. That's, we'll have to just save that for next week. Okay. Yeah. May, may I continue? Carry on. Okay. Bruce Lee was in Fist of Fury and then uh, Jet Li in Fist of Legend. Now, Donnie Yen also played this character in a television series, which is, th- this is kind of a technically a semi-sequel to the television series. Uh, Chen Zhen, term, you know, character that a lot of people think is real. And what's interesting here is it's very clear this was meant to be almost kind of a response to the uh, Green Hornet movie because they turn Chen Zhen into almost a superhero with a mask and a cato like outfit as he comes back to China from uh, after fighting in the trenches in Europe in World War One and kind of you know has to restore Chinese honor once again. Uh, Shu Kei is in this. Andrew Lau directs this. Andrew Lau, probably the greatest director currently working in Hong Kong and in China as far as uh, you know acclaimed films. Among his many great films was uh, the film on which The Departed was based. Internal, uh, Infernal, Infernal Affairs. Affairs. Yeah. So Andrew Lau, big deal. Um, as time winds out, three more of these films. Kingdom of War, two-disc Blu-ray, part one, part two. This is a Thai martial arts historical epic uh, by another director with a name even longer than Joe's, at least his first name, Chatri Chalam Yukol. I hope he picks a name like Bob. Uh, you know, these Thai period films, they get a lot of money from the government because the uh, crown prince of Thailand is also a filmmaker. Uh, directed The Legend of Surya Thai some years ago. So they got a lot of money to make this stuff that glorifies Thai history. They really get to amp it up. This thing is heavily, heavily historical, a little bit hard to follow because it's so rooted in, uh, in, uh, in history. But it's re- once you kind of get into the groove and realize that you don't need to keep track of all the characters and the stuff that's going on, it's an awful lot of fun and very, very well done. Last two films, The Warrior's Way. Um, this one features a lot of people you might recognize, like Kate Bosworth, Danny Houston, and Jeffrey Rush. I know what you're thinking. Danny Houston in a martial arts movie? I wish somebody would use martial arts on Danny Houston. You know what? The Warrior's Way is a Hollywood film that just plays everything as if it were a video game. Too much effects work. It's terrible. This thing is so annoying. It just gets on your nerves instantly, and I think Jeffrey Rush wishes he'd probably never made this, but it was probably a good paycheck. Another bomb from Relativity. Uh, so that's on Blu-ray and with a digital copy. And then lastly, Takashi Miike's 13 Assassins, which is just bloody terrific. Mark, did you see 13 Assassins? Yes, I did. Did you like it? Yes, I did. Pretty great, isn't it? Yes, I did. Thank you. Uh, Mark's already checked out of the show. Uh, no, Takashi Miike, of course, does like 50 films a year. The guy, it's like a movie a week. It's insane. He's so prolific. Uh, but this one is just feels like an old-fashioned samurai epic, and it is awfully great. It's like his way of saying, I could do, uh, you know, the Seven Samurai Takashi Miike style. I'll do the Seven Samurai plus six. It's pretty great. Uh, you got to check this out. Fantastic transfer on the Blu-ray. Uh, Magnolia really outdid themselves this time. They've done a lot of martial arts films on Blu-ray, but they have not done any that look this good, including, frankly, uh, the John Woo Redcliffe stuff. Doesn't look this good. Really? This is really this nails it, man. Redcliffe right. is gorgeous. Redcliffe gorgeous. So, uh, meanwhile, send your new uh, suggestions for our openings to gods at digigods.com. Any other questions you have? Gods at digigods.com. Check out the Facebook page, and we will see you next week. Mm-hmm.